All right, can you please shut my door? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm just waiting a couple minutes to get the meeting started. That's her. Hello, Melissa. Hello. Hi, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Hello. Hello. We'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Oh shoot, doggy, you gotta go lay down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Everybody that's just come, I'm just waiting for a few people to join. Got a couple more minutes. I'm hoping Fran remembered <laughs> that he was our special guest host, but certainly uh, you know, we've got some <laughs> we've got some good news to share for tonight. So that's nice. Um and I will I'm just wait in a few more minutes. Still people joining. If anybody else wants to give updates on how their week is, how what's going on. <laughs> Melissa, I think your news is the best news. That's what's going on. <laughs> it's pretty good news. It's pretty, it's good news pretty news. great news. Congratulations. Thank I you. mean, really. Good. Yeah. And, you know, and it wasn't just us. Um, certainly we were part of that uh, uh, lawsuit. Um, they did, you know, there were four lawsuits filed saying the same thing. So the judge, they were all combined into one. So if you look at that, that order, so certainly other, other organizations also did help with that, but ours, uh, we were alongside uh, AWA and the Ojibwe tribes of Wisconsin and Michigan and a few in Minnesota. Um, so we aligned on the tribes on our federal suit and we won today. So yes. I guess I can start that meeting. Hey, we won. Uh, not, uh, it, it is, uh, I know there's those of us that obviously we care about Yellowstone wolves, wolves in the Northern Rockies. Um, but I do want to say, you know, again, it's that act locally thing for right now, wolves in the Great Lakes, uh, their protections were restored on the Endangered Species Act. The one really good thing about this victory is that it's been turned back over to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it will have to go through the entire, uh, comment period if they want to do that and this administration would have to make an effort to want to delist again so that's the victory but i don't want to keep fran our, our guest speaker on hold too long hi fran thanks for joining um fran is with the carnivore coexistence institute at uw madison and fran you probably know about the wind so that's what we're talking about today that wolves were restored to the esa with our lawsuit so that's awesome news so I am actually going to turn it over to you, Fran. Um, we do this call every other week. We were doing it once a week all of last year because of the <laughs> craziness that was. Um, so I think this, you know, I'm glad we won our state suit. I'm glad we won our federal suit. I'm glad to see that others are, um, uh, that, you know, that we are getting some, some reprieve. However, we know what work we have to do with the state's hostile management. And I can't, you know, I hope that relief comes for the Northern Rockies soon. There is an emergency lawsuit there and a petition to have wolves in the Northern Rockies relisted immediately. Wisconsin's treatment of wolves was a primary reason that we won. 
Uh, they're not treating them much better there either. So I, I am still cautiously optimistic. So that's the update. We can talk about that again. Um, I don't want to keep Fran on for the whole hour unless he's got lots to share. Uh, but I'll let you uh, him talk over or introduce himself. And he's got some new exciting research. Thanks for joining, Fran. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. And uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining as well. Um, um, so as um, Melissa mentioned, I was previously with uh, the UW Madison's uh, Carnivore Coexistence Lab, led by uh, Professor Adrian Travis. Uh, now I, I recently made the move to Playa Coyote. Um, um, I am their Big River Connectivity Science and Conservation Manager, and uh, my position there is a co-lead on this big river connectivity project that is spearheaded by both Paya Coyote and their Wilding Institute with funding from the Be Wild Rewild uh, Foundation and the uh, E.O. Wilson's uh, Half Earth Project as well. And uh, our focus there is in basically in uh, carnivore protection in the Midwest and the Mississippi River Basin, as well as working on rewilding uh, to allow carnivores to have their cores, their connectivity, and be able to recolonize uh, this region, uh, especially certain uh, focus areas that we'll, we have, uh, including the Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota <coughs> Northwest region. Uh, but uh, we're here to mostly talk about wolves, uh, and uh, we do have, uh, we did release, uh, Adrian and I, a recent paper two weeks ago that focused on what happens with Wisconsin wolves basically uh, when they are both uh, protected, when the, so our analysis of Wisconsin wolves, the most recent uh, research that came out and I'm, I'm looking for the link to, uh, to put it in the chat there. So just one quick second while I look for that. I can tell you a funny story where Fran's looking for that. He and I once had a photo contest on some old toilets up north once. <laughs> I still remember that fun time. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> a business that was selling like toilets, like a, a porcelain company went out of business. So they put all these toilets out on the street. So we took some pretty funny and goofy pictures. Just something to fill the time. <laughs> yeah, you got to have fun while doing That's this. That's right. <laughs> um, so I, I just pasted the, um, the study on, uh, on the chat for everyone to see, and uh, it was released two weeks ago, and basically our intent here, this is a follow-up to a prior paper that we released, uh, I think two years ago now, that uh, was analyzing the effect of reducing protections, federal protections for wolves in Wisconsin. During the period before any wolf hunts were established. So a uh, period between 1979 and uh, 2012, before any wolf hunts started. So that paper basically analyzed what was the effect of reducing protections for wolves in uh, a bunch of, uh, in the different causes of mortality that wolves were suffering from, and that they still suffer from, largely. So what we found in that paper was that when you reduce protections for wolves, and again, I'm gonna highlight that reducing protections here, does, here doesn't mean public hunts. It means uh, allowing uh, landowners to kill wolves in their properties or allowing managers to kill wolves in response to conflict. So very limited, but, li but nonetheless liberalized killing of wolves. What we found in that study is that when you reduce protections for wolves, when you allow agents, managers, or landowners to kill wolves legally, right, through permits or through managers taking, act, taking reactive actions, poaching of wolves increases. And not only poaching of wolves, but poaching that you don't find on the landscape, poaching that the agency dismisses when uh, taking into account mortality for um, estimating population sizes. Therefore, one of the implications of that study, uh, a few implications, one is that when you reduce protections for wolves, 
the only thing that increases is not legal killing of wolves. Uh, poaching, which is of course an illegal activity that should be disincentivized by public agencies also increases. And this ghost goes against any claims uh, repeated by both federal and state governments that um, poaching is going to decrease, that human cause mortality is going to decrease if wolves are uh, delisted or if protections for wolves are reduced. So a follow-up implication to that is that since the period that we studied that from was prior to any wolf hunt established in the state, is that when you actually started implementing those wolf hunts, poaching might have increased further. And again, not only poaching, but poaching that the agency doesn't see in the landscape, the poaching that we call cryptic poaching, because you don't, you don't find those dead wolves. You hardly ever even find the transmitters that those wolves have. These wolves, of course, have collars uh, that, are, um, that are implemented uh, right by the DNR and the DNR um, basically collected the data that we're using for our research. Now, the, the follow-up to that study is what happens with wolves and what happens with poaching of wolves during the year. So when we were taking account in the prior study federal protections, these were periods of time that spanned across uh, years and across seasons. In this study, we're trying to see how poaching is, is regulated throughout the year and what regulates, what kind of activities, what kind of environmental conditions regulate poaching throughout the year for wolves in Wisconsin during that same period, 1980 through 2012. Now we use again DNR data of uh, for around 500 wolves that were monitored, basically all the wolves that were collared and monitored by the DNR throughout this period up to 2012, when the DNR just stopped making this data on, uh, on monitored wolves public for, uh, for both the public and independent scientists to analyze. Now, some big implications of this study is that first of all, we found uh, that Poaching increases substantially, both uh, poaching that you find on the landscape, poaching that is reported to the agencies, such as federal and state agencies, and poaching that is cryptic, poaching that you don't find on the landscape. Both of those increase substantially by over 200% during uh, periods where you have snow cover on the ground relative to periods where you don't have snow cover on the ground. Now, what, th what this, uh, the implication of this is that snow cover is a major environmental factor mediating poaching of wolves in Wisconsin, arguably through making it easier for would-be poachers, for individuals with inclinations to poach, to detect wolves through following and using, using their tracks and therefore making them easier to um, making them easier to, to track basically and to poach. Now, those are periods of snow that affect, that increase substantially the likelihood, the hazard that a wolf is gonna be poached in, uh, in, uh, during those periods. Now, another uh, important point here is that poaching is in fact the major cause of mortality for wolves in Wisconsin. The likelihood that a wolf is gonna get poached in Wisconsin that is gonna die by poaching is higher than the likelihood of a wolf dying by collision, of a wolf dying naturally, of a wolf dying uh, by legal killing, uh, etc. So it's a big deal what we're talking about here. This is a major cause of mortality for wolves and not only in Wisconsin, there's evidence that it's a major cause of mortality for wolves in, other, in most other US wolf populations. So it's a big concern and that's why we wanted to hone in on this particular uh, human cause mortality, right? In addition that it's uh, an illegal activity that should be minimized by public agencies. Now, that is basically the environmental condition that allows for um, poaching to occur on the landscape relative to those periods where you don't have snow on the ground. It gets worse, it gets far worse for, for wolves when there, is, uh, there are hunting activities or hounding activities on the ground while there is snow on the ground. So 
when you have snow on the ground, and I'm going to repeat this just to make it clear, the probability of poaching, of a wolf being poached, the hazard, the risk of a wolf being poached increases by over 200% relative to periods where when you don't have snow on the ground. Now, add to that individuals on the ground during hunting and hounding seasons. And the probability, the hazard, the risk of a wolf being poached relative to periods where you don't have snow cover and you don't have hounding or hunting increases by over 650% when you have both snow cover and hunting activities on the ground. Now, this of course implicates human behavior in poaching, in regulating poaching on the landscape, and it implicates uh, the period where certain activities, certain individuals are on the landscape um, with uh, using or using the landscape for consumptive activities. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we can argue that hunters are poaching wolves, right? Just because it happens during the hunting season. But it does mean that would-be poachers, individuals with inclinations to poach, be them hunters or not, right, are using these periods of a lot of activity, of a lot, a lot of human activity on the landscape as cover for illegal activities, that, such as poaching. And this is what the combination of snow on the ground, making it easier to track wolves, as well as the cover that so many people on the ground with certain inclinations to poach are there, is what increases so much the, uh, the risk, the hazard of wolves being poached. So um, the implications for this, of course, there's a lot of evidence from, uh, there's a lot of social science evidence from Wisconsin focus groups survey instruments that indicate that certain demographic groups, uh, some deer hunters, some bear hunters, some farmers, not only sanction, and, and again, I'm not generalizing here, but we have social science data that certain uh, portions of these groups not only sanction, but participate in wolf poaching through focus groups, through social science surveys in Wisconsin within Wolf Range to these groups, right? Specifically bear hunters, uh, uh, deer hunters and farmers. Again, not implying that all of these individuals or the majority of these individuals partake of these activities, but that there are certainly inclinations to poach there that are higher than any other demographic in Wisconsin that uses the landscape. And that we find that during these periods where those individuals are on the landscape, wolf poaching increases substantially, again, over 650% relative to periods where you don't have snow on the ground and you don't have these individuals on the ground. Now, as a comparison, just as a comparison, right? There's a difference here between reported poaching, again, poaching that the agent that individuals find and report to the agency, and therefore the agency has the data for these wolves, and cryptic poaching, which we identify through uh, wolves that have, that are colored, that are monitored by the DNR, but suddenly disappear and you don't see them again in monitoring. You don't ever see them again in monitoring. You don't see them going to Minnesota. You don't see them going to Michigan. They just disappear from monitoring, right? And this class of individuals that disappear for mo from monitoring is huge because it's around a little less than half of the wolves in our sample. So over around, around 45, 46% of the wolves in our sample and the wolves that are monitored, collared and monitored in Wisconsin disappear from monitoring. And the agency doesn't know what happened to them. So the assumption by the agency is that these wolves are, are dying from the same causes and in the same proportions as uh, wolves that you find on the landscape. That they died, that died from legal causes, that died from uh, reported poaching, that died from collisions. But again, we know that it's not true because poaching is so much harder to detect on the landscape that it even incentivizes the uh, concealment of the activity. Therefore, we know that 
the poaching that is reported is only a minimum estimate. It's an underestimate systematically of the actual poaching that's out there. And now if you, uh, to that, add that almost half of the wolves that you monitor in the state go missing without evidence of what happened to them, then that leads you to the conclusion that there is rampant uh, poaching in the state that is not being accounted for by the agency, even in their models of population sizes, despite again, poaching being the major cause of mortality for wolves, not only here, but in a lot of US wolf populations. As an example, we did a similar research, uh, similar research on Mexican wolves uh, that was released, uh, uh, I think a year ago now, maybe beginning of last year, uh, as a with a as a collaboration with uh, Paya Coyote, the their science advisory board, and we found similarly that Mexican wolves, when you reduce protections for Mexican wolves, and again reducing protections, meaning uh, letting landowners or agents, not public hunts, landowners or agency uh, managers shoot wolves, that increases the disappearance of Mexican wolves by 121%, reducing those protections. So again, implying here that this idea, this hypothesis that state and federal agencies usually advance of tolerance hunting, that allowing the hunting or the lethal management of wolves is gonna lead to individuals being more tolerant of them and therefore less human cause mortality is absolutely false. We can find evidence for that, uh, for that hypothesis in Wisconsin. We didn't find evidence for that, that hypothesis in the Mexican wolf population. And again, this is a population, the Mexican wolf population is a subspecies that's incredibly endangered and that with only, with only has always had less than 100 individuals that are very heavily monitored. So the implications of that study about what happens with poaching once you reduce protections is far, uh, is far more robust than our analysis in Wisconsin in Wisconsin and, uh, and converges uh, with uh, those conclusions are sort of very similar that we see there. So um, all this combines, right, with uh, our sort of research on uh, lack of enforcement of poaching in Wisconsin, lack of importance on um, estimating poaching, especially cryptic poaching. And again, there's a lot of literature here that state that that states that that is a significant, if not the major cause of mortality for wolves in a lot of wolf populations. And yet we don't see that either federal or state agencies put a lot of resources, put a lot of research, uh, have a lot of enforcement focused on poaching or anti-poaching interventions. Now, uh, the last thing I'm gonna say, and, and, uh, and after uh, uh, we can just chat about the uh, study and conclusions is that um, added to this is the fact that uh, on our previous study, again, with Wisconsin wolves studying the effects of reducing protections on wolves, we not only found that um, poaching increases, that is cryptic poaching that you don't find increases. We also found that relative to periods where wolves are completely protected, when you reduce protections for wolves, complaints increase not only proportionally to, uh, not, they not only increase, increase proportionally to where or and when there were full protections, they increase non-proportionally and over time. So that relative to periods of full protections, when you reduce protections, you get more conflicts, more wolves kill, killed, because of those conflicts as well, in addition to more poaching. So this adds basically right, to a picture of, those are the only two causes of intentional killing of wolves, legal or poaching, right? You wouldn't add uh, collisions to that list of intentional wolf killing. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to imagine how you see a wolf and the wolf just stands there while you sort of uh, run them over with a car. But the implications of this study is that there's a lot of human behavior here being connected with the policies that 
uh, guide wolf management and that the policies themselves have a particular indirect component. You know, the direct component of a policy is what it actually does, such as sanction something when you get a fine for not doing something, prohibiting an act or sanctioning an act, for example. But there's an indirect component of policy as well, which is that when you either sanction or uh, an act or prohibit it, you are also sending an indirect value signal to the public. For example, with, with wolves, when you state that you're going to reduce protections, you're basically saying, you know, either there are a lot of wolves on the landscape or we don't value them as much anymore. And that's why we're going to allow for them to be killed in legally or publicly in whatever way. Right. When that occurs, the public gets a message and individuals with inclinations to poach are going to get uh, their own message, which very well could be, again, there are enough wolves, uh, perhaps the agencies can't sort of manage this population, and maybe I'm doing a service to the agency potentially by just taking care of wolves myself if I see them while I'm out uh, on the landscape or if I'm facing any sort of issues with them in my, you know, in my land or in my private life, right? So a lot of implications here. And it's something that we're trying to highlight and we've been trying to highlight for years because again, what we're seeing with multiple wolf populations and we also have right now with uh, my work with Project Coyote, we're doing similar research with Michigan wolves, with the wolf population in Minnesota and with red wolves. And we're consistently finding that as you reduce protections and as you have individuals on the landscape with uh, that engage in consumptive activities, that there's evidence that they have inclinations to poach, then inevitably poaching and not only poaching that is reported is going to increase. And of course, public agencies have a responsibility to mitigate any type of illicit use of a public trust asset, right? And that's what we're trying to sort of uh, highlight with this work. So I appreciate everyone listening and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to have a good chat about this. So- Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Ryan. that was great. I guess I, I will ask the first question, if people just wanna use the raise hand system, if you don't know how to do that, you can put your, I think we there's just this small enough group, <laughs> let's just not shout over each other. But base, I was listening to what you said and I, I heard this presentation before, would then you say that Wisconsin wolf population estimates overall are under? Yeah. Like when the DNR comes and says there's a thousand wolves, that, that then based on this study, what I'm hearing is there's really not a thousand wolves because you're losing half of your monitored population. Yeah, correct. And a good example okay. is uh, we released a study about what actually happened with the 2021 wolf population after the hunt last year in the summer uh, in uh, the journal Pier J. And uh, we found that taking into account what our latest, uh, our, our previous study of what, how uh, wolf mortality increased when you reduce protections, uh, mainly uh, poaching, uh, wasn't taken into account in DNR wolf population models. And in fact, if you took that into account and you added the amount of wolves that died from poaching during those periods where you have individuals on the landscape and there was no underground, like it happened with the wolf hunt last year, then we estimated that potentially over uh, another 97 wolves might have been poached during that period where you saw that the quota, we hunter just blew past the quota as well. So just with that estimate, you almost have a hundred wolves less there. And Again, this is something that has been systematically happening for years to the extent that you need to question if it's the biggest, the highest cause of mortality for wolves in Wisconsin, you need to question where those estimates are coming from and if they're actually uh, robust enough to, to actually implement management with. And I don't, you know, and of course we had this plan before we got the decision today. So I don't want to, I want everyone to be like, oh, Debbie Downer day. But I do, I, I actually think this worked out perfect because while yes, great victory wolves are back on the ESA, you know, I don't want everybody to hang up their hats, which I've done too, where I've relied on federal protection, but like wolves are fine. I can relax. Based on this new research, we cannot relax. 
So no. I think this is a good time with the new wolf management plan coming out. I'm going to talk about that later, um, especially on the next meeting where we just talk about advocacy. But while I think it's great that we're celebrating that we know that poaching goes down, at least when wolves are protected, certainly this is being underreported and certainly the agency isn't taking this seriously. So, well, yes, I want to celebrate and I, and I'm going to, I'm going to eat pasta or I'm trying to I'm be on a diet, <laughs> but uh, that I think, you know, this is just something really important to hear that wolves are always going to be under threat. A big reason of why we pushed for wolves to be relisted back on the ESA and a good chance for us to go after the agency on lethal control. I mean, we had over 80 wolves killed since the hunts for depredation causes. To me, that's like a second legal hunt by the agency. And right. no one's really talking about those numbers, right? Which is like half of that quota that the hunters killed. So uh, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. We should absolutely celebrate, but I, I do just kind of want to connect what Fran's saying to what happened today. And we're going to talk nice and be happy when we're done. But, you know, it, it is something where I, I want everyone to celebrate and breathe a sigh of relief, but know that we still have more work to do as advocates to make our agency work for wildlife. So that's my soapbox. I'm done with that. We can take any other questions. And I would say I would add to that before taking any questions that we should be pretty cautious with that decision and the implications for Wisconsin, because the decision also stated that or found that there were adequate regulatory mechanisms from uh, the states in the in the Western Great Lakes to manage their wolf populations, despite everything else that led to the current decision of relisting. Uh, the wolves in this in this region, right? So if there's another attempt at delisting, which I'm sure there will be, and I'm sure it will be better prepared, then they already have an argument that the court has agreed with, which is the states, as they currently stand, have adequate regulatory mechanisms for protecting wolves. And we know that, especially with this research, that may not be the case. And we would argue that that is not the case considering. Great. Does anyone have any questions? Somebody has a question. <laughs> what about me? I'll just, I'll, until someone's ready, what do you think? I mean, this isn't your area of expertise, but maybe you just have an opinion on it. Um, one of the things we saw today, clearly in social media and on everything, is oh boy, they mad, they big mad Wisconsin bear hunters and and what we consider to be, you know, we're an advocacy group, we can say it that our enemies in this back and forth wolf battle. What do you think about incentivizing rewards for poaching? What can what can a regular person do to to de-incentivize this? I mean, besides ask the agency to do their job, but I mean it sounds like with the snow, I have a hunch that that's probably from hounding because the dogs are out there running on coyotes and, and bobcats and everything else. So it's easy to poach and they can do it all year round. Um, certainly, I think the snow helped on our slaughter in February. But what do you think about reward systems? We are going to reissue that again because every time, you know, and the agency likes to agree with them. See, you've created a bunch of animosity. But apparently with your research, that's not true. So I don't know why the agency thinks they should say that. But what do you think about reward systems? Do you think that's something? What else can, we, what can an uh, individual do to help push your research through and to help decrease poaching, I guess, is my question. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So it, our research also found that, you know, there was a period between uh, 1995 and 2000 where uh, the method of censusing wolves in Wisconsin changed a little bit to have a lot more people counting wolves on the landscape. Uh, so there were a lot more people counting wolves, which arguably were wolf supporters, had positive attitudes towards wolves on the landscape, doing the work of finding wolves so you could get uh, uh, good counts. During that time, where you had a bunch of wolf, uh, a bunch of people with positive wolf views on the landscape, we saw that poaching decreased, actually. You know? So there could be an effect here of poaching decreasing because those individuals with inclinations to poach that use these periods as to conceal their activities now know that there are other folks on the landscape that might report them, that they have to be more careful, right? So that's a good sign, I think because it highlights that 
you know, you could have more wolf supporters on the landscape, for example, not simply counting wolves, but if you emphasize, for example, more recreational non-consumptive activities on the landscape year round, that involves stuff like wildlife watching that you can do all over the landscape as well, then that could have an effect on reducing the risks of wolf be, wolves being poached. Why? Because arguably, most of the uh, a lot of the individuals that are out there right now are individuals that potentially have those inclinations to poach, and individuals with positive wolf views uh, mostly stay home, right? Or only go out in certain times of the year, or you know potentially not during hunting season because. They don't sort of like they don't want they don't like the risk or stuff like that, right? So that's a good sign, I think, because it gives sort of an opening to hey, you need to connect with individuals that have positive attitudes towards wolves, and even more than that, increasing protections for wolves also has that indirect policy effect that you're saying, hey, folks. We value wolves, we want to protect wolves and we're granting them full protections. So even the signaling from an agency that they are going to do something that they are treating something seriously, potentially could work even without enforcement, You know, even without actual enforcement on the ground. So if you're an individual that, um, that likes wolves, you know, potentially taking one of these tracking courses and getting out there on the landscape and encouraging other individuals to get out there on the landscape might have a more, uh, more of an effect, a positive effect on wolves than you might think, even if you really don't get to, you know, see the wolf yourself, right? So I think that's a good avenue for that. Um, and of course, you know, that along with all the other activities that I'm sure folks here know on advocacy, like submitting comments to the DNR, making sure that the DNR is aware of the relevant research and all that jazz, right? Great, thank you. I, that's awesome. That's good. That gives me some thought. That gives me some ideas. <laughs> okay, I think Sarah Andrews. I know she's at work, but she really wanted to join this because she had questions. So, Sarah, go ahead and unmute yourself, and you can feel free to ask. Hey, Sarah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um. I, you know, like Melissa, am a wildlife rehabilitator. I rehab raccoons and I'm going to be attending the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Symposium in Madison in the first week of March. And one of the main conversations that I'm interested in having with rehabbers is how to change the DNR and how to change uh, wildlife policy specifically. And I, I definitely plan on talking to Melissa and um, another couple of rehabbers that have been working on these issues for a long time before that symposium. But I was wondering if you could give me any guidance on like kind of my goals. So I have basically my goals are to connect people who have shared values and, you know, shared desires. Because I think one of the biggest issues in wildlife advocacy is it's hard for us to find each other. We're just not involved enough. Um, and, you know, obviously rehabbers are very interested. Um, and I'm hoping to get some guidance of, you know, from people who actually have made a change in their local department of natural resources on how they did that. Mm -hmm. So I don't, that's a lot, a lot of, you know, that's, that's kind of my line of thinking. And I was wondering if you could give me any additional insight there on what I might pursue in terms of data or connections. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I wish I could say that I've had an impact on a public agency. <laughs> Because uh, I think have. come on, <laughs> being a thorn in the side is a full time job. Let me tell you. <laughs> but yeah, they're very good at ignoring, I guess, itches and thorns and all that stuff. You know, maybe they're too big, uh, right? But that said, um, uh, there's a there's a lot of ways, you know, and I'm, you know this this conversation, this group of people, this organization, uh, organizations like Paya Coyote, etc., are great ways to get involved, get to know other advocates in your state, uh, get plugged into actions that are going to actually have an impact on, you know, agency or commission um, uh, decisions or regulations. Um, in, a, in addition to that, right, I think um, 
you know, and this is something that uh, I'm an interdisciplinary researcher. I, I do a lot of work on uh, wolf uh, demographics, wolf mortality, et cetera, but I also do a lot of uh, work on environmental and animal ethics. And uh, I think, you know, there's an issue here that is, is more often than not uh, sort of dismissed. And it's that the ethical conversation is critical for these types of issues. Um, especially when, as you mentioned, you're trying to build common ground with other folks. You're trying to find, find first of all, you're trying to find shared values. So you first sort of try to find folks that think like you, but the work, the work never ends when you find folks that think like you. The work is actually convincing others, you know, and, and convincing is the key word here, right? There, there can't be a type of imposition of a particular ethic. We need to have these conversations, you know, we need to sit down with each other and sort of come to an agreement as we do with science. You know, we, we take science, we say, what is the best available evidence that we have for this particular scientific issue? Where does that lead us? You can do the same with ethics. And in fact, there's a lot of room for this impulse that agencies, you know, based out of fear, uh, potentially based out of uh, arbitrariness or any other sort of worldview, they dismiss because they don't want to have the conversation. But there is ethical evidence that will point to a particular direction. For me, that direction is that when you combine the ethical case for wolves uh, being thinking, feeling, conscious, self-aware individuals that value their lives, that value their lives of their relatives, much as any of us, right? We are all mammals and we all have those basic emotions, those basic cognitions that we should cherish and we should sort of highlight. When you combine- yes. Sorry, go ahead. No worries. When you combine that with the contributions that wolves make to society through their effects on the environment, right? They're giving us services basically for free by just doing what they do, then there is both an ethical and a scientific case for establishing full protections for wolves. Especially when you add to that, that killing wolves results in more conflicts, which results in not only more dead wolves, but more domestic animals killed and more producers upset at wolves. So again, I think there's a lot to be said for needing to start having those ethical conversations that that means educating ourselves on how to have them and how to start accomplishing the, that common ground. Well, right. So my, my kind of point in having this conversation with these particular people, um, you know, obviously we all work on different species, but I think we all kind of share a goal of protecting all wild species. And I think rehabilitators can take a really important role in this because people often accuse us of what, not knowing the animals, not knowing what they're like, not understanding their effect. And we raise them from tiny babies to release. So I feel like we have a really strong case to say, hey, look, we know wildlife. We've worked with them intimately. We can see their value. We can see their intelligence. We can see their contributions, how they care about each other, you know, all that stuff, which is why I'm so interested in getting rehabbers, you know, we have so much stuff to do. We're feeding babies, we're doing intake, we're raising money, but like moving beyond that to actually doing policy change from our perspective, because I think we have such a unique connection to wildlife that right. goes kind of beyond what most people see, even if they spend a lot of time outdoors. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. I'm, I'm only just cutting you off there just because I don't want to keep Fran on for too much longer. I promised him only 45 minutes, but it's okay. Uh, I, I got to start a... working anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. Uh, Kevin, you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, hey, I was going to thank Francisco. I'm a fellow UW-Madison grad, so I, I can appreciate it. Go Bucky. Um, hey, I may be a little bit different than some folks on the call. I'm actually a hunter, um, but I'm a big wolf advocate and supporter. And uh, I was just curious, in your research, did you find any correlation? I, I have a theory, that obviously, maybe. Um, any correlation between the, the uh, gun deer season and more poaching? I, I kind of feel like when you're up north... Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's radio shows that you call in your harvest and you celebrate the hunt and there's a tradition with it, you know, and there's always two or three assholes that call in and like I shot, a, you know, seen wolves and shot a wolf. And I, I kind of feel like that's when most of the the, the poaching goes on. And, uh, you know, obviously members of my group don't do that kind of stuff. But um, I was just curious if you're you're 
you know, your studies found any of that correlation. And I'll end with, it was a hell of a win today, and I'm, I'm damn proud to be on the call, and I do have my cocktail to celebrate. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers, uh, Kevin. Yeah, great question, Kevin. Uh, we did. We did. In fact, those uh, those periods that I mentioned where there was both snow on the ground and hunting and hounding were periods, uh, I would say, between uh, November. We're mostly within the deer season. So around mid-November up to the first week, first weekend of January, which is pretty much that is a cutoff for most counties just stopping their uh, deer hunting season. But, you know, as you probably know, the deer firearm season covers pretty much that whole period. And that's where we see this jump of from 200, uh, from a jump of 200% when you just have snow on the ground, which is pretty much the, uh, the late winter, early spring period, right after deer season ends. Uh, the prior season to that, right, that November to January period where you both have snow on the ground usually and uh, hunters on the ground, that's when we see poaching increase, both unreported or cryptic and reported both um, combined over 650% relative to there not being snow or uh, there not being a hunting or hounding season. So that is particularly a particularly hazardous period for wolves. And in fact, it might be the deadliest period of the year for wolves on the landscape in Wisconsin. Interesting. That's kind of what I thought is like, it, it, that's when you get more people in the wolves or more people in the woods with guns. And the, if they're not seeing deer, they, you know, idle minds do bad things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do want to add, and, and, and as Sarah was saying, having these conversations of finding shared values, I think really this year, I think I've met more, I didn't know that there were ethical hunters left. I really felt like, where are you guys? But, you know, they have come together. Um, and I, you know, I think, especially for wolf con uh, conservation, we know, as Fran was talking about social studies, most, most hunters don't hate wolves, even though it feels like it. It feels like it. It's just, they're not very outspoken. They're, they have, I don't know, ask Kevin why white men that don't speak out for things. <laughs> but well, there's, um, a, there's a bunch of us. Eh? Yeah. I'm not the only one, I promise. But I do want to, you know, I do, I, I do want to give, uh, you know, Kevin, I'm sure was afraid to join us the first time and, and now really feels like part of our wolf family. So, you know, I would definitely encourage those, the, unfortunately where we are at right now, and it's not fair and I get mad too, is that hunters have the ear of the agency. And if you can find more hunters to kind of join together, like we did on the billboard project um, that, you know, I found that we have a lot. I mean, I was just talking to a hounder today for an hour, you guys, that is, he's had it. And I never thought that I'd be like, I love this guy, but I did. And, you know, wants to start a, um, a you know, ethical landowners united to try to stop some of this, um, you know, really, you know, we're, we're, we're too far away. There's some of this egregious stuff. So I do think as, I want to thank Fran again. And Fran, if you want to hang out, you most certainly can. I appreciate it. Uh, there is a link to his research in the chat and this will be uh, recorded if you want to share his presentation, but thank you for all your hard work and research. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I, I, that's really all we have really have today. You know, then we can talk about celebrating the win and what's upcoming. Um, we will do a pr uh, one of the ways you can get involved, as Sarah was saying, is we've got the Wisconsin Conservation Congress coming up. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't write a resolution asking the DNR to take wolf poaching more seriously. That's a great example of a direct ask from the public, or you could ask, you know, to to re reduce some of this hounding on public and state lands. So we're going to do that. Uh, the, those resolutions are due March 11th. We're going to go through and do one together as our next presentation. That's the next big thing. But I do think, well, yes, this poaching research is bad news. I wasn't happy to read about it. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> but, but it's not that I'm saying let's put wolves on the back burner. What I'm saying is let's go on the offensive. We're always on the defensive when it comes to wolves and wildlife, especially these egregious things, predator killing contests, uh, hunting wolves with hounds. I, I'm, you know, even hunting bears with hounds. Uh, you know, I found some common ground with trespassing, just trespassing or asking that the agency invest in more wardens on the ground. I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea, but uh, we will go through that next time. Um, and I don't want to overwhelm everyone. There's a lot of information, both good and bad. So thank you again, Fran. But if anyone else has anything they want to discuss, otherwise we can wrap it up a little early tonight. And cheers, we won. Yay.
<laughs> Let's have a happy note. Yeah. Um, uh, cheers. Oh. Yeah, cheers. I'm just going to add real quick that, you know, it's a very important point to make. And I think it allows for a lot of bridge building to when we're talking about issues like poaching and what kind of individuals engage in an activity, right? I mentioned that uh, the social science data just inevitably just has focus on certain groups, bear hunters, deer hunters, farmers, because they live in wolf range, because uh, some of them might show certain conflicts with wolves, et cetera. But we're finding in Wisconsin, as well as in other wolf populations, that it's a tiny minority of individuals that engage in these activities that might just be ramping up their activities during particular periods of time where they have more cover for these illegal activities. And therefore, these are going to be times of periods of the year where you have a lot of people in the landscape because arguably the agency just doesn't have the capacity to be patrolling, monitoring all those individuals, right? And all the all, all the conflicts that might be happening there. So I think that it's a it's a point that should be foregrounded in conversations about what to do with you know wolf management, wolf policy, and how can we converge on solutions that allow for all of us wolves, but also, you know, subsistence hunters and farmers to have less conflicts, to be less harmed all simultaneously, right? And that is, I think, ultimately the goal. So Great. thanks. And, and, and we do have the wolf management plan for Wisconsin. When, when, he, when Fran was talking about the judge saying there was, you know, that we had a, both of our state lawsuit and our federal lawsuit, but that you know that the the proper mechanisms are here. Well, we need to improve those mechanisms. So please don't anybody rest and say, "Oh, fine, wolves are protected federally." Because I'm sorry, but this is going to go back and forth and back and forth. Especially as we lose land. Fran works on connectivity. I work on connectivity. It's you know it's a shrinking natural world. Um, so we will have that. That came out today. The official committee that Kevin represents us uh, on that committee. So thank you for that, Kevin and Sarah, uh, who is also on this call, who's a farmer. So we have a hunter and a farmer representing wolf advocates. And I think that's one of those bridge gaps, but uh, we will be talking about that when that comment period comes up and we're gonna really need to not go away just because they're protected. We need to fight for a state, you know, and like I said, we, we've got to keep, uh, well, yes, I care about the Northern Rockies, I do. I. <laughs> I absolutely do. And there's, you know, they're fighting there too, and we've still got to support them. But we could be a model for what could happen in other states because we haven't worked as much as people think. We've won here and we're we're probably in equally as a as a for a while, they're equally as wolf hostile as Idaho and, and Wyoming. And, and we're making positive changes here. So I guess I just want to wrap that up, letting you know what's coming up in the next fireside chat. It'll be one of those boring ones where we have to do a bunch of work, but it's the work that we have to do. So the next thing I see on the horizon is the Wisconsin Conservation Congress and helping you, um, you know, making sure we're getting common resolutions in many counties. There are vacant seats where you could sit in Conservation Congress and making sure that the issues that are important to you, wolf poaching, mm -hmm. bear hounding, that you're getting resolutions that are written well and that will be accepted. And if there's anything else, I think we can just wrap it up. It's good to so, see everyone. And Melissa, to... I got one, one more question. Sure, go ahead. Francisco. Um, you know, I, along Melissa's line, I, I, th I think we need to keep the pressure on kind of like we're playing chess, they're playing checkers. Um, but is there any other studies that you have forthgoing that that are going to be coming out that could help, uh, you know, I think help feed the cause kind of deal or anything else or that you're currently working on that uh, obviously you did a lot of poaching studies. Is there further ones you're doing that, you know, could help, you know, state our cause and show, you know, so when this does resurrect, which it will, I think Melissa's right. It's going to it's like a seesaw. It's going to come back and forth a little bit. Um, you know, do you have any other ammunition, to, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't doubt that it's going to come back and it's going to come back pretty soon. I think as soon as the Fish and Wildlife Service has time to draft another delisting plan, basically, um, uh, which, you know, could be they, they really get their their ducks in a row when they want to do this stuff somehow. Um, there are we do have other research uh, sort of on the on the pipeline. Uh, we just released this one. I mentioned the uh, Mexican wolf study that we released last year, and it's an analogous study of that Mexican wolf population. Uh, we're currently working on similar research for the wolf population in Michigan. 
Uh, and uh, hopefully that will come out later this year, if not at the end of the year, as well as uh, Red Wolves. Uh, we're collaborating on research with Red Wolves. Some of that research on poaching of Red Wolves is already out there. Suzanne Hagen um, has a study on poaching as well as on surveys uh, down there in the North Carolina recovery area on inclinations to poach as well. So those, uh, those mirror the ones that we have in Wisconsin. And now we're adding uh, a third study that we already registered the methodology for um, to be as, as um, sort of scientifically transparent as possible. And that one is gonna take sort of a, the population of red wolves and is gonna do a combined analysis, basically combining the, the two Wisconsin studies that we did on poaching the uh, inter annual one of reducing federal protections as well as what happens during the year uh, when you have hunting on the ground, when you may have other activities on the ground. And hopefully we'll be submitting that in the, this month at the end of the, the month. So I can, yeah, I'll definitely let uh, Melissa and others know what that And I did, I did post, uh, Britt is working on it now. I did post Fran's research she put in the chat. You can find that in our advocacy tools section on our website as well. So uh, all the new, we try to keep that new research up as much as we can. We're actually gonna have a new, more user-friendly website. So we're kind of in between balancing both, but if anybody wants that, just contact me. That's just a, one click for me. So that's something easy to do. Yeah. All right, well, I hope everybody has a great night and uh, enjoy the win and prepare for the next battle. <laughs> and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.